The bench. Andrea is bored of being here. He has traveled too much in his long life, considering he started when he was barely a teenager. Almost 40 years of traveling. He should be happy to be in Bali during a season when Venice is always so damp and cold, but he's not. It's just too hot on this island, and the literary festival was not what he had hoped it would be. Yes, Andrea. A, N as in Nancy, D as in dog, yes, then R as in Robert, E, A. He must scream to be heard over the loud music from the speakers of a basement hall below a restaurant where he's come to hear a rapper slash poet, an American slash Vietnamese who's also a novelist slash activist for the Indonesian slash Brazilian forests and for brown minorities everywhere, for youth, for anger. Yes, yes, I know. I know that Andrea is a female name in many countries, but in Italy, it is a man's name. The name means man anyway. So I don't know why they use it as a woman's name, really. Yes, I do find it a bit irritating. Does it show? His mother is American, but for some reason Andrea picked up a slight English accent during summer school in England, which serves him well in his circle of uh, ataraxic jet-setting friends. Jet-set, is that still a word? Doesn't using this outmoded term already prove that Andrea at the age of 56, is really in the wrong spot listening to an angry rap song in some basement with torturous acoustics? Bang is up there on stage, with his likable-slash-angry round face, a striking ancient Mayan sculpture of a face, Andrea thinks, with those pouting lips and the intense stare of his dark eyes darting around the room as he sings a song about Bruce Lee, reminding the crowd that I risk my life every day here on stage because I risk my reputation and my reputation is my life. Bang paces up and down the floor, not really a stage, just the basement of a restaurant with columns and marble floors where the terrible sound system reverberates with a dirty crackle crumpling vowels into consonants. Andrea has a hard time understanding not only what Bang is singing about, but also what Nilima is asking him as he runs his finger through his long, blonde-slash-white hair. Well, my grandmother comes from an aristocratic family in Venice, Andrea answers, but, you know, we don't like to talk about these kinds of details in Italy, Nilima. Yes, I did write a novel about the roses in my family garden, true. It's been the book that sold the most. Why are you surprised? Maybe in Bangladesh they don't care about roses. What can I say? Nilima is a new literary sensation on the glamorati circuit. She comes from a political family in Bangladesh. Her uncle was a president, her mother an important minister a few years ago. She's angry and committed and ridiculously photogenic with long, shining black hair, strong chin and jaw. True, those incisors may appear slightly too long, but they are mostly hidden by the sensual lips and the attention is magnetized by the intensive stare of eyes underlined by circles she doesn't bother to hide. They give her the gravitas men seek when sporting a beard. Andrea suspects Nilima is trying to mock him. He is already irritated with the festival organizers. They put him in conversation again with some Italian journalist he's known for years. He doesn't like him. He's some Bellamy, some guy from a little town in a valley up north who had the luck of getting a job in New York and from then on he has been able to have a career and some mediocre sort of success. And he pops up everywhere and they always make him interview him on stage even though it's clear they don't like each other much. Here comes Sebastian, an established literary legend, a headliner at the festival, he slowly walks his lanky body in one long step at a time like an ancient wooden crane trying to besiege a castle. Noticeably tall, long arms and legs, a thick neck on drooping shoulders. And yet, he has one of those faces that never age because they never really looked young. He had one of those intrinsically English jaws and long cheeks. He could be a new wave lead singer from the early 80s, Andrea thinks, and Sebastian indeed was briefly in a two-man group with a guitarist called Tristan at some point. Sebastian looks over at Andrea, sitting in the back with Nilima. 
and gives them one of his famous smirks that always seem to be taking the piss out of everything he looks at, a real English bastard with intelligent blue-green eyes and a long nose. Sebastian looks like he knows he's the last specimen of a better era, venturing into a stupidly dangerous new one. The English writer sits down on a bench perpendicular to the floor where Bang is still rapping on about his rage and reputation. He looks untouched by all the fuss and waving arms up there on stage. He slowly raises both eyebrows and looks over at Andrea and Nilima again. He says something to them, but the music is too loud. What? Nilima says. I said, Sebastian raises his voice to be heard, am I covering your view? No, no, don't worry, she answers. Are you sure? Sebastian insists. Yes, I am sure, thank you. But Sebastian looks uneasy. He's embarrassed about being so tall and blocking the view of the show. Something in his upbringing pushes him to do something about it. Fidgets and shifts on the bench. He barely knows Nilima. He was introduced to her earlier in the green room after a panel debate among the flurry of agents, writers, organizers, and moderators running to their sessions. He tries to say something again to Nilima, who can't hear him. What? Sorry, I can't hear you, she says, now slightly annoyed. In her eyes, Sebastian represents the hated middle-aged white man who is proud of his country's past, a colonialist past that Nilima finds bloody shameful, not only when it comes to Bangladesh, but really, in the entire worldwide mess it created. Are you sure you don't want to trade places, Sebastian insists. No, no, don't worry. At this point, Sebastian feels embarrassed to have insisted so much and is overcome by the necessity to blurt out something funny and ironic, typical English tick, in order to get out of the situation. Well, I don't want to block your view is all I'm saying, but... I can't think of any other solution if you don't want to trade places short of me leaving unless you want to come and sit on my lap instead, says with a comical grin, tapping both palms of his hands on his thighs. Nilima's jaw drops. She turns pale, her eyes widen in anger and shock. Did he actually just do that? Did that tall, goofy Englishman ask her to sit on his lap while slapping his big, slimy hands on his two long legs? He did, didn't he? She's undecided on what to do. She's about to say something, but purses her lips and instead storms out of the basement while Bang keeps rapping slash storytelling. Andrea looks at Sebastian, who now seems puzzled by Nilima's reaction. The Venetian decides to walk over to the bench and sit next to Sebastian to defuse the situation. He's always despised conflict. He attempts small talk, but he has a hard time understanding anything. Is it time to buy those hearing aids his doctor suggested he should get? No one would be able to notice them under his long blonde and white hair, he's thinking, as Madhavi, a charming Indian writer of romantic novels, walks in. I just saw Nilima run out. She said she's quite angry with you, Sebastian. What happened? Andrea explains to Madhavi what happened, so she says to Sebastian, Nilima, rushed to the restaurant next door, and I think it might be better if we all went to talk to her. You might need to apologize. We've got to defuse this fast. Defuse? Apologize? For what? I was only trying to be gentlemanly by not wanting to cover her view. What the bloody fuck? I think she might have taken it differently, Madhavi says. You think so? Look. I'm just a lower-class bloke, and now I must go and apologize to this heiress because she's interpreting a polite gesture of mine as having sexual undertones that were not at all intended. It's insane. She might have a sexist issue with it, but I've got a class issue with this. How about that? This is so humiliating. It might become something bigger than it already is, Madhavi insists. Sebastian sits to think about it. He's had a few friends, well, no, acquaintances, okay, people he knows about or that he's had to deal with whose careers have been ruined forever by episodes like this. Does it matter that he had the best intentions and was only trying to be kind? Why does he have to give in to this spoiled, talentless brat who waves a feminist flag under his nose? Because she can, that's why. So now he starts to worry. 
Even his own wife might not like this. I mean, she'll take his side. But there could be a doubt somewhere. He is one of those men, which he isn't, is he? No, 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 he isn't. His most famous smirk is gone. And the corners of his mouth are pulling down into a sad grimace, his eyes getting smaller and smaller, his head tilting to the side, his wrist disappearing between his thighs, shoulders slouching. He looks suddenly so tired. No one in the small group is even pretending to listen to Bang, who, out there singing on the marble floor, realizes something is up. Sebastian gets up and says they should go find her. They find Nilima sitting by herself at a long wooden table at a restaurant next door, tapping something on her phone, tweeting about this thing, Sebastian, who then rushes over to the table, scaring Nilima, who looks up from her phone, collects herself and pretends to be indifferent. Listen, Nilima, I don't know how you might have interpreted what I said, but I want you to know I'm the least likely person to have wrong intentions and to mean something lewd or offensive when I made that remark. I'm no hashtag me too. I'm a hashtag me neither, if anything, believe me. I only made an innocent quip in front of everyone with no intention to offend. But if you have felt offended, which again was definitely not my intention, I do apologize to you. Nilima doesn't crack the smile everyone was hoping to see. She thinks this is too easy. Apologies are not enough. Saying sorry is not the point. This Englishman doesn't get it. He's just trying to save his skin. The point is that he should never have done it. He doesn't understand why it was wrong. Okay, I do accept your apology, but I remain angry at what you've said because I just find it unacceptable, even as a joke, says Nilima, still furious at him, but trying not to show it. Sebastian sighs loudly in frustration. Well, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I have apologized. There was no intention on my part to offend you. So I hope this stops here and there will be no need to mention it again. Can we agree to that at least? Nilima nods reluctantly and goes back to sip her cocktail. Sebastian moves to the far end of the same long table next to Madhavi and Andrea, while Bang's stout figure arrives after his concert and creates a buffer between them and Nilima. Even the most illustrious career can end on something as silly as this, says Andrea to fill the gap of silence. I really don't know what to add, says Sebastian. This thing has gotten out of hand. You know I wouldn't say anything inappropriate like that. I'm not one of those men. And I also resent having to humiliate myself like this because of a misunderstanding. Two beers later, Sebastian leaves the patio and decides to go back to his hotel room. And yet, Andrea says to Madavi as soon as he's gone, I don't know if I would have made that joke. That's my point, says Nilima who now rejoins the conversation with Bang. If we let it slide like that, it'll never change. On the other hand, if a tall woman covering my view asked me if I wanted to sit on her lap so I can see the concert, I wouldn't take it as a flirty joke, says Andrea. Yes, but what is the important difference between a tall woman and a tall man when you sit on their lap? There is a difference. You can actually physically feel that hard difference if you're not careful, right? Yes, Andrea says. And then he decides to shut up, thinking he would rather be back in Venice, in his garden, with his roses, away from this world.